So then you tried to go to the World CrossFit Games, is that right? Yeah, so that's the holy grail, basically. Yeah. So for eight years, you try and get to the World Games and everyone starts CrossFit and they'll go, right, I want to get to the World Games. And it's just, then it's just, you think you're going to do it and it's just a massive task, but you try. And if yeah. you're one of those people that keeps trying, you will keep trying and you'll get there. Every year they send out, for five, for five weeks, basically they'll send a workout to do every week. You have to complete the workout and you then put into a leaderboard in Europe and then the top so many in the States will go and the top so many in this region will go and the top so many in Europe will go and you all go to the States yeah. and you compete at the CrossFit Games. So obviously I want to go there. And so you came close, am I right? I came very, very close a yeah. few times and I was always harboring this dodgy shoulder of mine that yeah. I'd injured myself and I think... It, it was bad, my shoulder, but I think as well I'd learnt that it hurt and I had this mental block with it. So as soon as I did the exercise that originally tore it, which was a muscle-up, mm. um, every time I stood under the rings, I, it would hurt, even before I jumped up to the rings. So I already... Well, that tells you it's the mind then, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. the mind. It's the, I think it as well it was probably injured and I had the I, operation, yeah. but... I think it was just a mental block. So I had to step away from the rings and I didn't go near any rings for a year. Yeah. So I could forget that that was a learnt pain. If, if you're going to do that exercise and it's going to hurt and you have got that injury, so all, all of that's valid. But if you start feeling the pain that's been triggered prior to the exercise, it's your mind telling you what's coming. I'm anticipating the, yeah. the pain before it's even there. But I'm giving it this, you know, so. Yeah. Your mind's going, oh, no. It's yeah. that learnt pain. And I do say this to clients. I say, is, is it actually hurt or are you thinking it's going to hurt and it's learnt pain? Mm. And that's what happens when you have an injury and you keep on training on it. You're then hardwiring. When you do this, your shoulder hurts, etc. Yeah. So I do believe that your mind is key. It's key in these areas of of absolutely getting over obstacles so i actually went on to do muscle ups and actually be fine with them and i actually really started to enjoy them so i yeah. know it was in my head yeah. um but anyway I, I did i came very very close uh on my last real attempt to get there i thought of four hours of training a day for five six years it's yeah. a lot yeah it takes a lot out of you and i know you try and you know, you think age doesn't matter, and it doesn't, but it does start to take its toll on the body. Yeah. I, I noticed as I was, I got into my 40s and everything started to slow down as regards healing. Because yeah. from MMA, I was in physio, constantly in physio. You know, I always had injuries. Yeah. And everything just starts to slow down. You don't heal as quick. Yeah, and then the ability to get stronger is, is, is you always... You're always running to stand still, I always say. You're running to stand still some of the time. But obviously, I wanted to try and get there again, so I did. Yeah. Um and I got approached. I got approached by the producer of the show. They wanted to, they wanted me to go on, um, and they said, "We'd like you to come on the show, Special Forces Ultimate Hell Week." So this is coming off the back of you. You've tried to get to the World CrossFit Games, and then where does the TV company come into this? How do they so know about you? So I'd seen the show the year mm. before, and it was in in Wales, in this yeah. country. And a CrossFit athlete, a lad, had been on it. And he, he, he'd, um, I, th I don't know when he went out. I think it was week one or two. Or th I don't know, actually. Um, and I'd watched it. And I th it was the first time that that had been on TV. It was, yeah. it was one of the first times that sort of show had been on. And I watched it and I thought, that's, that's so good. I wish I could go on that. And then the following year, I saw it advertised, do you want to be on the show? But I was yeah. trying to get to the World Games again at that point. This is TV appearance number four. Correct. <laughs> and this is a long one. But this is a challenge, yeah, a big challenge. Yeah. And I'd watched it the year before and I thought that looks phenomenal. Am I right in saying it's basically they get a group of people that think they're super fit or are super fit and they're going to get some special forces and they beast them. Correct. And they see who drops out. Correct. And I'd watched it and I thought, I'll have a go at that. Yeah. So I went for an audition at the same time as trying to get to the World Games. And... Uh, I thought it would be in Wales and I thought, if I get to it, it's in Wales. If I don't like it, I'll drop out, I'll go home. I, li I, I It's just down the road, it's Wales. Yeah. Anyway, it wasn't because they'd got a bit more budget that, this year, the second year, because it had done so well the first year. Reggie Yates was going to host it. 
So uh, then a bit more money. So they told us all. We would like these people on the show. I think it was 22 of us. I think about seven girls. And uh, they said, but we're going to film it in South Africa. That's a bonus, isn't it? Well, it was a bonus. <laughs> yeah. But I was still in my head in World Games mode. Yeah. So I was still trying to get to the World Games at that point. It's funny, you see, if you'd have gone to the World Games, you wouldn't have been on the TV show. If you hadn't been on the TV show, there's, there's lots of alignments and synchronicities. And when you loop back... They, they said to me, they said, don't do any more weight training, just run. And I thought, well, that's not going to happen because I love weight training and I'm trying to still get to the Games. So I'm going to keep doing that. Yeah. So right up to the actual deadline of me saying yes to the show... It you was were still the, doing it. it. I was doing my weights and everything, trying to get to the World Games. And it was literally... I went to bed, woke up in the morning, looked at the leaderboard. I was out of the contention to get to the World Games and I was that was it. It was game over for me. Mm. Um, so I, in my back pocket, I thought, not a bad thing. I can go to South Africa. That's not a bad plan B, is it? It wasn't a bad plan B, but they'd sent me some boots to break in and do lots of running in. And I'd done none of that because I'd been weight training. Ah. So I was too muscly when I went out to South Africa, really. Yeah. Um, and too and too heavy. And I hadn't done enough running that they'd asked me to do. And I knew there was a lot of endurance athletes on the show. This is the thing with most military training, workouts, everything. It's it's running, running, running. And body weight. Yeah. Yeah. The ability to do that. I yeah. mean, pull-ups. You're, you're not using dumbbells and things. It's all relevant to your own weight. So backpack, chin ups, press ups. Yeah, up, backpack on, and, yeah. 20 kilos on your back or whatever it was. Yeah. And you were running in full kit. Yeah. You know, you're not running in, you know, your ASICs trainers and your nice lightweight shorts. You're running in full army kit, boots, socks, everything. Do they treat you and speak to you in a certain way as well? Because I've seen, on Channel 4, I think it is, they have the SAS programme. Yeah, so that, that came after because is that it, was... They they polished it up and then they got Ant Middleton on there and he's phenomenal and the, the mm. other guys and they 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 made that show fantastic. But this was sort of one of those like I think it was like bef slightly before it. Yeah. Um, so did the beast you like they did because they identical yeah yeah so it they was, speak to you like crap really. Do you know what that show did to me? That show ruined my CrossFit career. I'll tell you why. Because at that point I thought this CrossFit. I thought that's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It's the hardest thing anyone can ever do. And I was a little bit one of those that I don't like to use the terminology, but they call you CrossFit W-ers. <laughs> um, that's what they call you. Bankers. Correct. Yeah. Because all you talk about is CrossFit. Yeah. You live and breathe it. And you think it's the hardest thing you're ever going to do. And it's the hardest thing you can ever do. And you do think that. And I did think that. And I went on this show and that show broke me. So then, and it's the hardest thing I've ever done. So CrossFit just doesn't cut it after that, does it's it? It's not, you know, yeah. that's what it ruined it for me. Yeah. But when I'm doing a workout now, a hard CrossFit workout, in my head I'm thinking, oh, get on with it and shut up because you're not doing the octopus, for example, which is a thing that we did on the show in South Africa, which yeah. was horrific. Um, and so, yeah, it, it ruined my career because they are on another level. Yeah. They are elite. It's it's like running now. Somebody will say, oh, we'll, we'll go and run 10K or we'll run five, six miles. And stuff. To be honest, if I'm running less than 10 miles, I don't really see the point. <laughs> you okay, know, so you it, get used to it. Yeah. I, I, very rare I run under 10 miles. I mean, the, you know, I, I, at least if I'm going past 10 miles, I can put in some steep hills and, is, you know, I can yeah. make it worthwhile spicy you know, yeah, yeah spicy. five ten k is not i mean by the time i put my trainers on i finished yeah you know it's not i, so I don't it, mean i'm fast but yeah. no but I, I know what you're saying so it's just it's just that level it's and I, like I, that's why i always say i always think back to when i was 20 and i thought i was super fit then and then i thought i was super fit at 25 when i was doing my north runs and then i thought i was super fit when i was doing you know all my classes and mm -hmm. this that and the other and I thought I was phenomenally fit when I was doing my CrossFit. And then I went to South Africa and I thought, what is this? Yeah. It's horrific. I found that with certain sports and athletes, say with ultra running or endurance sport, anything like this, you get to a certain level of fitness. You can get fitter, but once you get to a certain level of fitness, it 
reverts to mind. And this is why ultra running is great for males and females because generally in the strength sports where it's a burst of energy and you're lifting weights, men are designed the stronger and generally they'll always win those sports and you have men and women competing separately. With ultra running, you get past sort of 20, 30 miles and you keep going and the playing field is level. There yeah. are women winning yeah. these races, yeah. you know, and they're beating the men. Yeah. Because it's then not about the strength, it's about the metal. Correct. It's about Correct. how hard is this? You know? That reminds me of the pod, uh, I was listening to an audio book by David Goggins and yes. um, he was talking about that in that, in that audio book. Because so I think he did uh, the 100 miles and I think he was trying to keep up with a female athlete. Yeah. And he just, I don't think he ended up managing to do it. I don't think he kept up with her. And that's, that just reminds me of that because I I totally am on that same yeah. page. You know, there, there's, there's uh, you can scale things and you can say, oh, well, women are, they, they, you know, they have to lift lighter or they do this or they do that. And the men should be able to do this and they should be able to do that. But not anymore. I just mm. have girls now that I I'd personal train. Mm. And, you know, some of the young girls, they're outlifting the lads. Yeah. It, it's, I, it's irrelevant. I, I love the fact... Take the size of your muscles out of the equation and then we're just going to go that way and we're going to run for as far as we can. And then it, it all comes down to mind. Yeah. And then it's irrelevant of what sex you are. Yeah. You know, it's, it's how, how, um, how strong is your will? Correct. I, I, I firmly believe that. And I, I, I should be believing that because I grew up with two brothers and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the one that really went down that sport route. I really pursued it and I, I really wanted it. And that, that it was irrelevant what sex we were. Um, I run a boot camp on a Saturday morning with my my uh, business partner Martin, and uh, we just let people come along with their children if they want to bring the kids. They can, and the kids come, yeah. and they just they're they're looking after their children whilst they take part in that boot camp. And there's a, a little girl called Mia, and she absolutely kills the running to the point where Martin, who's a, another personal trainer, and my husband Charlie, who's yes. Ex-military and a firefighter yeah, and a very good runner. And a super fit guy. And a super yeah. fit guy. And it, they couldn't keep up with her. And no. I'm, she's about 10. So I <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's irrelevant these I days. I wish I could watch that. I've got a video. <laughs> oh, I've got a video for you, Patrick, if you want to watch it. Maybe we'll put that in at the end of the show. Correct, all right, then. <laughs> so, Francesca, this is when you met Charlie after you'd finished the show, the TV show. Yeah. 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 Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about that. Well, I kind of met Charlie before the TV show, uh -huh. but I didn't know I'd met Charlie because he judged me in a competition that I was at in Manchester. So, so he was a judge. He was for a judge a CrossFit competition. for a CrossFit comp. Oh. and so he judged me, uh, and he was fanboying on me, obviously. Yeah. So I didn't know about it. <laughs> but um, so Did yeah, he say, so I'm going to marry that woman. No. Apparently, oh. so he. He knew of me from doing the judging, and yeah. then I had an injury clinic at the CrossFit box in Wigan. Yeah, and he was doing a bit of CrossFit as well. As well, uh, obviously, he does a lot of lifting and things like that. And he'd hurt his wrist on a on a lift called a, a, a squat clean, and he'd hurt his wrist on that. So he booked into the injury clinic because he had a bad wrist, obviously. Yeah. So I treated that, and that's how we actually met in terms of knowing each other. Did he book in the clinic knowing it was your clinic? Yes. Ah. Yes. Right. So he he, he decided he was going to come and get you. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't get that. So we were just friends then for about two years. Right. Um, so, yeah, so we, were, we knew each other for quite a while before. Yeah. And then... Um, when, when I was going to go on the show, obviously he was interested in that because he's ex-military. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people had a lot of ideas about the show. A lot of people that were military had some things that they didn't like about the show and were saying, yeah, well, it can't yeah. be the same as, as... And it wasn't supposed to be the same as going through the military experience. Mm. It was just seeing if they could take some normal people that were quite fit and put them into that environment and would they manage to yeah. succeed yeah. Um, and being trained by... It, different people from different parts of the world. Yeah. It um, couldn't actually be the military experience because they wouldn't be able to film some of it. You know, it has to be... Correct. They just create a similar environment and say, you know... Yeah, can you handle I it? think it was as close as they could get yeah. to the, 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 the final few weeks, I suppose, yeah. the stages. So you got put in at stages you probably would, wouldn't would necessarily be put in at in a, in a real situation. You'd probably build up to that. 
but they put us in right at the that's that point so the the tasks we had to do were really really tough I mean some of them were awful um but Charlie was obviously watching the show on BBC Two yeah. after Dragon's Den at nine o'clock right. uh, every week, tuning in. And he just messaged me and just said, good luck on the show. And we just got chatting and yeah. and that was it really. So I think I'll, I think week two or three he came over to Wigan and because um, he lived in Bolton at the time yeah. uh, and watched it and watched it with me. So yeah, he sat in with me and watched the show on TV as it aired. So that was yeah. quite nice. Uh, but we didn't, we knew each other for a long, long time and we weren't really dating for a, quite a no. while. So and Has the age gap ever been a thing for you? Because, I mean, it shouldn't matter, but... No. So I originally went, no, you're way too young for <laughs> me. Just don't bother. And try to fix him up with a few other people. Uh, he had, right. had a few dates with a few friends of mine, which is a bit weird. Um, but yeah, he came back from the dates. Yeah, had a nice time, but still pursued the, should we go out for a date? Yeah. We went to the movies a few times as friends, but not a date. I suppose if he had given up, he, it shows he's got the same mindset as you, where he'd made his mind up and yeah. didn't care about what exactly. What the Apparently, rules were. he said it's... to his he said to his flatmate at the time, "I'm gonna I'm gonna marry that woman." So that was that. There you so, go. I was joking when I said that before. I didn't realise it. No, he did actually it. say that. Yeah. yeah, he did say that. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's quite nice. And uh, he he says a lot of things, Charlie. So, but yeah, he does. He's. He's a, a very a very good man, so I agree. Mm. I agree. So there's a couple of things, a bit more of a serious nature, but things I'd like to talk about that were pivotal in maybe your journey. And one is when you closed the second gym, the bigger yeah. gym, and you, yeah. know, you said you'd had a period of depression. Yeah. And then also with your anti passing, which was later. Yeah. Were then you decided that, you know, you're going to live life to the full and yeah, go for it. So correct. maybe tell us a little bit about both of those because yeah. I think it's very healthy, certainly with depression, because I've been depressed before yeah. and I, I talk about it. Yeah. You know, and it helps. It helps me and it helps somebody yeah. else possibly. It was the, the closing my gym and moving away from that, having my own facility uh, yeah. was like a bereavement in itself because I'd worked, I'd grafted, I'll say, grafted from... A good, t a good 10 years I grafted to get that gym up and running and have members there and, and to, to then walk away from it and leave it was hard. It's really hard. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done because yeah. um, you can never explain to someone if it's your business how much effort you put into it. You yeah. live and breathe it 24-7 for Everything. the entire time. Everything. You have to. Yeah. It's your business. You have to. Um, and the bigger it gets, the, the more work there is to do. And if you're not, if you've not got the funds to delegate, you're doing it yourself. And it's tough. It's really, really hard. And the whole point of me doing that was so that I had something to leave to my daughter yeah. when she finally decided what she wanted to do with her life. And I thought it might be in the the leisure industry. And it, it, she obviously ended up doing a degree in that. But um, it was it was so tough to walk away from it. It was it was heartbreaking, yeah. really. But I did do that. It's your baby, isn't it? It's something you love. It was, it? and for a while, I'd stopped. I didn't have the gym anymore, and I lost. I lost a sort of the path of my life. I, I was off the path, if you like. Mm. I don't you lose know. Your I was. I was and, just didn't know yeah. where I was, and I didn't feel like I was in the environment I should be in, mm. like a fish out of water, I suppose. Um, so for about a year, um, I really, really struggled about a year and a half, nearly two years, I guess. I really struggled with, with it. And I was in a, a bad place. I'd say I was in a bad place. And I always know when I'm in a bad place because when I'm in a good place, I love training and exercising. Mm. You lose your mojo, don't you? And when I'm in a bad place, mm. I don't want to. And that's no. not me. I didn't want to, I couldn't be bothered. And that just is not me. Yeah. If, um, I, if I'm depressed... I don't want to see people. I don't want to go outside. Correct. I don't want to talk to anybody. I stayed in bed. I did stay in bed. I was I was a nightmare. Mm. Um, and I'd lost a friend. A friend I'd said previously, I mentioned previously, a friend of mine who was very, very... I'd done a lot of cycling with him and triathlons with him. He yeah. he committed suicide and he took his own life. Mm. And he had two children. He used to take my daughter to school for me. Mm. Um and he had two children the same age as my daughter who lost their father, basically. And he, it was a mental health thing and he ended up taking his own life. And I think I went down that path 
And, you know, you think all sorts. You do think all sorts when you're in that state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I think you have to pull yourself out of it somehow. Mm. And, I, uh, and again, this is where you come into the, com it's a competitive nature. You either, you can't, you can't pull yourself out of it or you, you do. And sometimes you have to ask for help yeah. to get out of it. Um, yeah. But I, sometimes you just, you just have to do it yourself. I don't know. I think if you haven't experienced it, it's hard to explain to anybody. Yeah. And when you're at rock bottom, you, you've no energy. You've lost all luster and mojo and, and you start to, ask the question, what's the point? And you don't have purpose and direction mm. and you're not fulfilling your dharma, you're not following your passion and your yeah. heart. Once you get back on that track and you start to do something you love mm. and you feel passionate about it, then you you gain what they call enthusiasm you mm. know, again. And when you're enthusiastic about something, you have boundless energy, Yeah, you know? And yeah, de depression is something that I think we all suffer from to some degree at mm. some point in our mm. life, some worse than others, but... I think the biggest thing I'd say to anybody if you you are depressed and you're feeling like that is try and talk to somebody about it yeah. because just just by the act of talking, having a conversation, even if the other person doesn't have the answers, yeah, just getting it out and expressing yourself is a big. You know what, Patrick? I think my job over the last pretty much thirty years has been counselling, mm. believe it or not, because you do you listen to so many things. Mm. While well, you're personal training someone, or I'm a sports, I do sports therapy, so I do massages, injury treatments. They talk to me on a one on one, I see them week in, week out. They tell me everything, and it's quite draining, yeah, as well as a person to take that all on board. And I can do it for eight, nine, ten hours a day, I don't mind doing it at all, but it is quite hard work sometimes. Mm. And I think that may be kind of, um, I did. I moved away from the business, didn't have any direction. And then my auntie passed away and left six children behind suddenly and died of cancer. How, how old was she? Um, she was in her early 50s. Right. So very, you say your auntie, but actually not much older She than was you. my mother's youngest sister and my yeah. mum was one of eight. So she was really close to me. We used to share a bed and share the bedroom. Yeah. And when we were kids, you know, so she was my auntie, but she was not much older. So I literally saw her as a sister, really. Yeah. Um, and she suddenly passed away from, from after fighting cancer and getting over it and going into remission mm -hmm. and then passed away. So um, that was heartbreaking for me, but it kind of got me back on track. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought life's too short to be getting yourself in the in the in the pits of despair. Yeah. And uh, so on her anniversary of a, a first year anniversary of her passing, we I, I decided at the at the gym that I worked at the time to do a one work a, a workout every hour on the hour. Yeah. For the whole day, so I did a workout at six a.m. and we did one at seven a all the way through till we closed the doors at ten o'clock at night at the gym. Yeah. And I invited customers just to donate or to to join me on the workout, yeah. and it was the it was really really super hard. So you've you've turned something that was obviously a significant event and maybe a bit traumatic that she'd passed. Yeah, but you've turned it into I suppose something very positive there. Yeah, I ha yeah. I had to I had to do that, and I knew that she'd love that, and she because she watched me on the show on TV, and she absolutely loved it. Yeah, she was the nicest, gentlest. Nothing like me, sort of. Uh, <laughs> she was, she was, she was Mother Earth. She yeah. had, she, had, you know, loved being at home with the children and and that sort of thing. And she, she wasn't a big gym goer or anything, but mm. uh, she was fantastic, not a nice, but a genuinely nice person. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was, it was something I think that she would have loved to see me do. So I did do it for that reason, and yeah. we did raise, we raised so much money. It was great, and it was really yeah. enjoyable. I loved doing it, yeah. and uh, with CrossFit. I don't know if you understand this, but they, what they do yeah. is if, if there's a workout called Murph and it's it's after a, a lone survivor, the movie Lone Survivor. Yeah. And when someone passes away or someone dies in a, um, an amazing sort of uh, challenging situation, they'll use the date of birth or the time they died and they'll make a workout out of it and they'll yeah. make it super hard. Yeah. Um, purely because that person's been through maybe a super hard time and then they've passed away. I bet everybody tries extra hard with those workouts Yeah, as well, so a memorial workout, basically. Yeah. 
and I, I did that for my auntie's passing. So we used her date of birth. And what a good way to mark the day. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's a super hard workout. I've only done it twice. <laughs> Uh, and everyone was like, this workout's really hard. And I said, yeah. I know, it's meant to be. Um, and it just, that's the way I sort of yeah. remember her. So I know with lockdown and I generally, we don't talk much about COVID on this show because I think everybody talks about nothing else for a while. It's on yeah. every tele television channel, on every news broadcast. And certainly for me, if I give it my full attention, it gets me down. Yeah. You know, so I... I dip my toe in and out and get limited information when I think it's necessary, but I don't watch the news on a regular basis. And But what I do like to talk about is how it's affected people's lives and maybe how, how they're getting through it and how they're coping. Yeah. Now, I know there's been some significant changes in your world since yeah. this lockdown happened and yeah. since COVID happened and a change in your career path slightly or your yeah. job. So maybe tell us a bit about that. Yeah, What's I happened? will do. So um, I love to educate people. And I yeah. love to learn as well, which is amazing because I left school and didn't want to learn at school. Yeah. So I love that now and I know that I like enjoy that. And now we've got so many ways of learning. So over lockdown, I was working for a large uh, gym chain. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we, we went into uh, lockdown, obviously. And so uh, I was on furlough. And so I thought, oh, what shall I do? I'll do a few courses. So as you do. By a few. I've, there's a big list. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. So I did... Um, I did an assessor's course and a tutor's course and um, I got those under the belt. And then I did a hot stone massage course as well. And I've done a mental health course. Yes. Um, the mental Quite health. varied, but great for a whole holistic approach to uh, general well-being. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and over delivery. lockdown, I was getting yeah. numerous messages every day. For people asking about, was I a, because they see that I'm a sports therapist, they just see the word therapist. Yeah. And I had people messaging me. I must have had, you know, five to 10 messages every other day asking if I could talk about anxiety, talk about depression. Was I a counsellor? And, you know, I'm not a counsellor, but I do counsel people and I'm not a therapist, but I'm a sports therapist. So you can use therapy to make people feel better. So massage and things like that is fantastic for making people feel less stressed, less anxious, and just getting them out of the environment they're in into a better environment and better mental space. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I did all of that over lockdown. And um, I ended up getting made redundant, which was a mutual decision between myself and, and the company, to be honest, yeah. um, because over lockdown, I did reevaluate my life. And it was the first time in my life I'd worked for somebody uh, else, not yeah. worked for myself. Which is hard, isn't it, when you're used to being your own boss? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the captain of my own ship usually, mm. and I've, I've got very used to doing that. Yeah. And I'm, I can take orders. I'm, I've been in a team, in a CrossFit team, and I can easily take direction off somebody. Um, and I... And I will follow that leader as much as I think I need to. If they tell me to do something, I'll do it. Until they tell you something you don't want to do. <laughs> or if I don't believe in it. Yeah, yeah exactly. so that's that sort I mean. of thing. Yeah. 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 But anyway, I did. we came to the mutual decision that I didn't want to sit around on furlough because it's just not me. Yeah. Um, I want to be active. I want to be yeah. a proactive person. And rather than sit around on furlough, I can get out there and start working for myself again. So I decided to take the redundancy. I've just decided to go ahead and start my own business again with... So this is PT for you. PT for you training. Yes. Yep. Yeah. It came about because one of my best friends in Wigan, a lad, a young lad, uh, when I met him at the gym, he was a personal trainer and he was into the bodybuilding. Yeah. And he called me a CrossFit banker. Yeah. <laughs> earlier on. Yeah. He said, she's a CrossFit banker when I came in. And uh, I said, come over here, Martin, and I'll do a few of these workouts with me. And he came over and did a couple. And then, come over here, Francesca, and do a few bodybuilding moves with me. So I did a bit of that. And do you know what? I thought, I can fuse this together and make a different type of training modality. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was trying to work upon for the last couple of years. So I've been working on that. And... Uh, in the meantime, Martin started to really enjoy training with me. And he's now a fantastic athlete in his own right. He's competed in a few competitions, which I never thought I would see. Bodybuilding competitions? No, CrossFit competitions. Competitions, all right, okay. And he's now a CrossFit banker. 
Right. So, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he's, he's done that, but he still loves his bodybuilding. And I think what I've le- made him learn from this, and I think I've taught him this to him, and I, he'll tell you if I'm wrong, is that not not one type of training is the right way of training. Yeah. You can do boxing, you can do bodybuilding, you can do CrossFit, you could do running, triathlons. Whatever you do, there's no right or wrong way to train. So there's not one person that's correct and the other person's wrong or one PT that's right and this person's wrong. All training, there's great things to all training and there's bad downsides to it as well. Yeah. And that's that's what I've learned and that's what he's learned. Mm. So between the two of us, uh, over lockdown, he was doing some training in his house and his garden and outdoors. And I said, you know what? Should we do something together? So we, we thought we would. So we set PT for you training up and it's personal training for people, but however they want it to be. Yeah. Indoors, outdoors, at their own home. They can go to the gym and follow our program. They can come to us. We can come to them. There's a sports injury clinic side to it. You've got your hot stone massage. You've got sports injury treatment, strapping and taping, ultrasound, anything that's going to improve them their performance. Um, yeah. And improve their life basically yeah. i think it's really good as well really good to mix it up not just do one type of training or exercise it's great like that's why i started to enjoy triathlon because i'd be cycling one day and then i'd be running and then i'd be swimming and then yeah. I'd be doing some strength and conditioning and, and do you know what patrick it it gives you that focus so it it, it takes your mind off the depression and the, off the anxiety or whatever it is that's bothering you and it drags you slowly back towards the light yeah. So you might be in this dark place and I'm going, right, let's do a one rep max back squat. Let's see how much weight you can lift today on for one lift, for one squat. And for that hour that they're with me or 45 minutes or 30 minutes if they want it, for that time that they can manage to focus on that, they're not thinking about the depression, the anxiety, how they feel. And those little 30 minute windows in their week become hour windows in the week and yeah. to add a day window in the week of light and suddenly they're not in their depression anymore Bingo. and they're lifting out of it. If you're pushing yourself physically and exerting yourself after a short period of time, you're not thinking about how you're paying your rent. You're thinking about breathing. Correct. You know, I, I say to anybody, you know, if you've got mental health problems, you're depressed and stuff, trust me, if you go and run 100 miles, you've got a whole new set of problems. <laughs> and You'll not be thinking about all your daily problems. You'll 100%. Think, you know, so 100%. it's really good to push yourself to that. And it, it's nice to do some gentle, repetitive exercise, but it's really good to push yourself as well. Yeah, and even if you said push yourself, pushing, your, pushing yourself, you talked about that earlier on, running five miles is nothing to you, mm-hmm. but you know what? It's a marathon to somebody yeah. else, and that's what it's about. It's not about, you know, there's a, there's a saying, she competes with no one, so no one can compete with her. Brilliant. And I love that. And that's me. I don't, I've just, I've come to that conclusion in my life now that I do love competition, but I'm competing with myself. That's yep. what I'm competing with. I'm not competing with anyone else. I'm competing with me. Yeah. I just want to push myself. I love that. See, I talk about running and saying somebody that's gone from zero to 5K, counts to 5K. Yeah. That is a way more significant step than going from 20 miles to 40 miles. 100, or, or 100 40 yeah. to 60. I agree. Because if I can run 20 miles, then... Yeah. I'm pretty damn sure I can run 30. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm already running. I'm already pretty fit. I'm just yeah. going to run for a bit longer. Yeah. When you don't run at all and you're throwing out that first 5K, yeah. you've got to recondition your body. You've got to change the shape of your body. You've got to push yourself. So that step from no running to running, it's far harder than from running to running a bit more. Yeah. And you know what? The worst part is making that decision in your head to go mm. and do it. Mm. It's not actually, it's just literally putting your trainers on and getting yeah. out of your front door. That is the most the most difficult thing. You know, for someone to message me and say, Francesca, I'm thinking about getting some personal training. Can you have a little chat to me about it? That is the biggest step. It's huge. Yeah. And if someone's going to do that, then I've got all the time in the world for them. Yeah. I've been out running with a group, a Couch to 5K group, which is run by a guy called Sam, Sam's Warriors. And he's set up this group to help people, you know, um, some struggling with mental health problems, but generally just people that are struggling to help them. Beautiful group. And I went out running with them. And 
what happens is when you have your comfort zone and you set yourself small goals at first and you achieve them, and some of them might seem impossible at first, running 5K when you've never run for 20 years, you know, you run the 5K and you think, well, actually, that wasn't as bad as I thought. I've done it. Uh, I wonder if I can run 10. And before you know it, you start setting yourself with the goals, moving further outside your comfort zone until eventually constantly building your confidence. And then you start to think, what else can I do? And that's when you're evolving, you're growing as a human being, you're expanding. Yep. You know, and exactly. Achieving small goals at first. Yep. Then is that's the path to setting world records. That's how a world record, of course. a world record holder starts by achieving a yeah. small goal. Yeah. It's not you how know. you start, it's how you finish. Exactly. Always, always think that. And um, with myself being an older female, um, it's always been irrelevant to me, whether I'm male or female. It's always been irrelevant. I always say I should have been a boy when I was a kid. I was mm-hmm. always into that. I look good um, in a dress. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> My shoulders are too big. No. Um, but I always think it doesn't matter about your gender and it doesn't matter about your age. And this is where my new sort of plan to, is coming in. Yeah. Um, and it's it's aimed at people over the age of 30, over the age of 40, because I think we get forgotten about in the fitness industry. And I've been in it for a long time, so I kind of know. And I think it's always, everything's aimed at, the, the 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 appearance it's always aimed at that appearance you're looking in you're, you're in the most newest clothing or the fancy leggings or this or that and you're you're styling it out on instagram these days yeah and you know what what i'm not about that i want real real people and mostly real women that are over that certain age to start training look at your like so you're davina mccall's who's got her own fitness yeah. brand now you've got emma willis phenomenal looks amazing um yeah. and these women when I was a kid, when you got to 40, you've, you'd had it. Yeah. And I'm now nearly knocking on the door of 50 and I'm still thinking that I'm going to be amongst the youngsters training. And I mm-hmm. am, you know, I'm still doing it and I'm still want to do it. Um, so that's the next thing for me is the PT. PT for you training has got lots of branches coming off and I've got my PT for overs yeah. segment uh, uh, with it. Um, Martin is a a guy that's just turned 30. So he's doing that for the over 30s. And then I'm going to take the reins on the over 40s. There there used to be a a running joke. Uh, It's a sexist joke, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Yeah, go on. And they always used to say, for a bloke, you say, you're only as old as the woman you feel. Yeah. But you seem to have surrounded yourself with, including your husband, with young men. Yeah. (laughs) You know, so you're only as young as... The men around you, I suppose. Yeah. I suppose so, but not only young men, like young, just young, just young people. And it doesn't have to be that they're young. They're young in their mind as well. Yeah. You know, you know as well as me, Patrick, you'll come across people and look at Captain Tom, you know, a phenomenal. And it, it, in his head, you can see he's still in his 20s. Yeah. Same with me. So I, I'm a firm believer. I don't really care what your age is. Someone comes to me and says, right, oh, I can't do that because I'm I'm nearly 30 or I'm near... The amount of people that have said, oh, I'm, I'm 32. And I just look and I think, come on, yeah, yeah, come yeah, on. Yeah. It's irrelevant. I didn't really start to excel at sports. Uh, I mean, I did weights for years, but until I was past 40, you know, that's when I started doing better at sports. You want to be ready for it. You need to mm. be ready for it. You need to want to do it. And I'm not one of those people that wants to force people. I had a personal training client recently. And she won't mind me saying this. She's one of my neighbours. And she kept on talking about personal training to me and I kept on talking back to her, but not, not really trying to sell her anything and not asking her if she wanted it. And then she texted me and said, when are you going to offer me some personal training? And I went, well, I'm never going to, because I wait for people to come to me. That's the way I I work. I don't shove it down someone's throat because they won't be ready. And so I went, do you want some personal training? And she went, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> and she's fantastic. She's gone from doing nothing to training. And I th- I think I've created a monster because we're a yeah. month in now and she's pretty obsessed. She'll be a CrossFit banker, won't she? She will. She <laughs> yeah, will. Yeah, I'm sure she will. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I just love that. I just love inspiring people. So. so what's next for Francesca? I know in your show notes, we talked about the fact that you possibly want to write a book. Yeah. And also about stand-up. I know. You know what? It's something that I've wanted to do 
for my whole life. It, I love jokes. I love stand up. Yeah. I'm dry. I'm quite dry witted. I do. Tr- and I've got, I've just got this urge to get on the stage and give it a go. I've always said it. I'll tell you who inspired me to do that. It was French and Saunders. Yeah. Females again. You know, youngsters. When I was a youngster, French and Saunders were the females on TV that were, you know, yeah. the, the comedy double act. And my best friend, Alison, and my best friend, Alison, I've been friends with her for years, for years and years and years. My, my daughter's godmother. Uh, she's just hilarious. And we just, we are literally are on the same wavelength. I don't even have to speak. And you're married to Charlie. So I'm got married to Charlie. Limitless material. Yeah. My material with Charlie <laughs> is through the roof and off the scale now. Since yeah. I've been married to Charlie, I've got so much material. I mean, even last night, I was absolutely in stitches in this restaurant because he'd said something and I just, I, I wanted to write it down because I thought, yeah. and you know, other comedians, they talk about their partners yeah. all the time. And I say, Charlie, you are giving me so much material. You're making me want to try and do it. So yeah. that's the next thing that I think I might give a go. Well, that's good because it's completely different and then it's it's less physical and more about um, overcoming fear because you've got to get up there and be per- be prepared to be ridiculed. You know, Correct. you're putting yourself on a pedestal and you've got to o- open to, you know, abuse and stuff. But I've got a cousin, Andrew Smith, and he did a lot of stand-up toward all around the country. And I always admired him for doing that because that's ballsy, you know. Yeah. I, I really like that. Exactly. I yeah. think you're putting yourself out there. And I mean... I've done it all my life, really, because I've taught exercise classes. So you're always at the front and you're always yeah. at for being ridiculed as well in that way, because people will always, they're always going to, they're always going to question what you're doing or question what you're saying. And they're looking at you and you're the person there at the front. So you're putting yourself out there mm. to be, you know, ridiculed or whatever, or have things said about you. And that's what life is like, unfortunately. Mm. And it- it's but you need t- to laugh at it. Yeah, of course. You need to laugh at it. And I, I think there's nothing better than laughing. It just makes you feel so good, I think. Yeah. I say to people, if you take life dead serious, it'll yeah. kill you. You know, that's the by the definition, dead serious. You know, you need to remove the tension from your system and you need to learn to laugh. If you take everything too seriously, especially yourself. I've learned to laugh at myself. It's very healthy to not yeah. take yourself too seriously yeah. either. But with stand-up, it's real time. You're on a stage. You do not know what's coming next. No. And so you've got to think on your feet and react. And it's, it's real time. Good. You know? it's, that's why I think I want to do it. Because like back going back to those CrossFit competitions, when they used to tell you, this is what you're going to do today. And you didn't know. And you had to just react to it. Yeah. Or going on the total wipeout and running across those balls. And you had to react to it. Exactly. It's the same thing. You're on a stage and you don't know what's going to happen. And you've got to adapt. You've got to overcome. react to it. Think on your feet. You yeah. have a will prosper or you won't and I just like that I just find that quite exciting so it's it's one of the things that I'd like is on my bucket list yeah I'm just going to mention as well I've just got a puppy so I've not had a shave and I didn't realize I was going to change my life now you you have dogs as well don't you yeah they're three 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 years old and there's two of them yeah, we've Mitch got a, and Mavis. a little chihuahua called Bruno. And I like the name because I thought if we ever lost him and we're shouting for him, people expect this big dog to come bounding around Chihuahua, the corner and yeah. this little chihuahua would come round. But he's wonderful, but, you know, he needs a lot of attention. And we, you know, I'm, I, I think it's really important to give a dog a lot of exercise as well. Yeah. So I'm walking him three times a day and running him all over the fields yeah. and everything. But but I didn't realise, I thought I did, but I didn't realise what I was taking on. You know, he's, he's um, changed my world for the better, probably, because he's made me re-prioritise my, manage my time differently, you know. Yeah. And, and I can't come in at four in the morning and work now, and I can't work till ten at night. I've got to go home. So yeah. it's probably good. Yeah. Might have saved my life. I'll tell you a funny story. So my dogs, Mitch and Mavis, brother and sister, um, over lockdown, I was doing a lot more running than I normally do. I, I don't really do any running, to be honest, because it yeah. used to make my ankles ache after doing years of it. So I stopped doing it and started doing CrossFit and lifting, and it's, it was easier on my joints. And uh, I started running over lockdown, and uh, so we could only go out for an hour at the start of it, couldn't we? Yeah. It was an hour of exercise with your dogs or without your dogs. It was an hour. So I thought, right, Mitch and Mavis, harness is on, strapped them to the lead on my waist. Run. 10K. Yeah. 10k these little dogs their little legs we were doing that most days so it got to the point 
Whereas normally you go up to the dog and you get the lead out and they're going crazy for the lead wagging the tail. I get the leads out and I couldn't find Mavis or Mitch anywhere. And they were hiding from me <laughs> because they were just didn't want to exercise. It was hilarious. I had to film it. So we got to the point now where I've calmed it down. That was them saying, come on, yeah, calm down. So now I've just gone down. We've, we've, we've scaled it back and I'm just back to the one run a week now. So running club. I'm starting my next running club for beginners yep. on the uh, 13th. I think it's a Sunday, the 13th of October. And where are you based? You're Wigan way, is it? We're Wigan, yeah. 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 So uh, it's on really near the canal. Yeah. So the runs will be on to the canal and near Hay Hall. All right. I, I go past um, the quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's, a really nice, it's a really nice place to be, actually. Yeah. It's really close to the canal, so it saved my life. Yeah. And it's a good place to start as well because the canal's flat. Perfect. You know, so. Perfect. Exactly. Yeah. That's, what, that's what my thinking is. Mm. And I go to the locks and I know the number. And I think, right, that's a good little benchmark there. I know where I am. Yeah. And you can go a bit further or you're not going to have to. Wigan's got that big, big line of locks as well, hasn't it? Fantastic. Past here, Hall from Amazing. Bolton, and then you've got the... Yes. Amazing. And yeah. I, I never knew that because I'm not from Wigan. Mm. So I've, I've actually got a kayak out the other day mm. and uh, we got an inflatable one and we got a, an actual hard kayak. And uh, we went up to the canal and whew, got on the canal. Yeah. And I thought, this will be good. And we didn't go very far because it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. And I've realised that with my dodgy shoulder, well, it's yeah. really tough. It's all twisting up. It's body, fantastic. It? Yeah. It's so good. So uh, might be giving it a go, but not as often as I thought I might. Right. So, Francesca, if somebody wants to come and do a personal training session with you, if they want to get in touch with you, if you want to yeah. find out a bit more about PT for you. Yeah. How do they get in touch with you? They can look on our website, which is the usual WWs, and it's PT for you, and it's PT four, the number four right, for you yeah. training. dot um, yeah. co uk, or they can go on Instagram and look for PT for you training. Yeah, uh, and Facebook the same, exactly the same. Yeah. Oh, if they wanted to, they can just Google me, Francesca Palmer. Yes. And uh, it'll just pop up. You'll definitely find me. Yeah, and if they go through the BBC and ITV and Channel 4, Correct. They'll, they'll find you they'll somewhere. They'll definitely <laughs> find me somewhere, so they will be able to find me. Uh, but those are the usual ways. Francesca, it's been enlightening. It's been fun. I'm really grateful you came on the show, and I'm glad you've shared your journey with us. Thank you. And thank you for having me on, Patrick. So I'm going to leave you with a quote from the book, From Pills to Peace, by me, Midnight McBride. And this week, the quote is... If you never give up, it's impossible to fail. And like Francesca, if you just keep bouncing back and keep moving forward and keep trying and progress and progress and progress, eventually you will get there. If you never give up, it's impossible to fail. This has been Midnight McBride on the Midnight McBride Show episode number 31. You can go to my website, midnightmcbride.com. You can listen to my radio show, the Mind, Body and Spirit show every Monday night on Salford City Radio at 94.4 FM or midnight till midnight, 11 till 12. You can buy my book on Amazon in paperback, Kindle or the audio book, which is also available on audible.com and iTunes. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook. You can also watch this show every week. It's out every Sunday and every Thursday and subscribe to this channel on YouTube, the Midnight McBride Show or Midnight McBride Channel. And the audio podcast three days after the show automatically goes out on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean and others too. Thank you very much for watching the show and we'll see you soon. Shalom.